as today's service was being planned and Beth was working on the bulletin and working diligently to put together the pictures and the names for our time of remembrance. She also was, not surprisingly, expecting me to come forth with a couple prayers and some scripture. And I kept debating between this and that, and I ended up looking at First Chronicles chapter 29, but there was a variety of verses I wasn't sure what I would use. And so I just had her put in a variety of verses, but I am going to, I think, start with the second verse and going down through about the ninth verse to start us off this morning. It is the story of King David and the ending of his reign. He had been a great ruler, a great leader, but if we know the past, we know he had not always been such. There had been times of trouble and times when David would not have done what God had desired of him, and yet he became in time the king. And now his rule is coming to an end. And he, he looks upon his life and he gives thanks. Solomon, his son, will be the next king. But he is not comfortable with some of the task ahead. And he doesn't feel that Solomon was yet ready. And so he writes. Using every resource at my disposal, I've provided everything for my God's temple. Gold for gold objects, silver for silver objects, bronze for bronze objects, iron for iron objects, lumber for wooden objects, carnelian stones for settings, anamite colorful stones, every kind of precious stones and a large amount of marble. What more, because of my delight in God's temple, because of my delight in God's temple. I have dedicated my own private treasure of gold and silver to my God's temple. In addition to all that I've provided for the holy temple, 3,000 kikars of gold from the gold of Ophia, 7,000 kikars of refined silver for covering the walls of the rooms, gold for gold objects and silver for silver objects to be used for everything the skilled workers will make. Who else then will volunteer and dedicate themselves to the Lord today? Then the leaders of the household, the leaders of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of the unit of a thousand and a hundred and the supervisors of the king's work volunteered to give 5,000 kikars and 10,000 darkas of gold, of gold, 10,000 kickers of silver, 18,000 kickers of bronze, and 100,000 kickers of iron, the works of God's temple. Anyone who had precious stones donated them to the treasure of the Lord's temple under the care of Janiel and Gersonite. And the people rejoiced with their response because they had presented their offering to the Lord so willingly and wholeheartedly. King David rejoiced greatly. This ends our reading at this time. The word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, the word of God within us. In Chinese folklore, there's a story of a teaching master, a wise man respected by all and sought out when there were important questions to be answered. One day some boys, and I'd be willing to bet they were early teenage boys, decided to pose a question where the master would be doomed to answer incorrectly. This is the way I will do it, says the one boy. I will go to the master and I will hold my hands together and I will say, Master, what is in my hands? And being a wise master, I'm sure he will quickly guess, it is a bird. And I will say, you are right, master. Is the bird living or is it dead? And then the boy explained to his friends, if the master says the bird is dead, I will say, no, you are wrong. And I will open my hands and the bird will fly. But if the master says, no, the bird is alive. I will scrunch my hands together and kill the bird and let it fall to the ground. And I will be smarter than the master. And so it is that the boy goes 
What do I have in my hands, dear master? And as expected, the master said, you have a bird. That is right, responded the boy. But now, master, tell me, is the bird alive or dead? The master took a moment for reflection. And he looked at the boy and said, the answer, my son, is in your hands. <laughs> Having answers in our hands can be scary sometimes. We have decisions to make, directions to follow, and we'd like to have somebody else once in a while tell us exactly how we should go forward, but we have to decide. David, the great ruler, the great king of Israel, remembered for his remarkable ways 3,000 years after his death. Shirley started off, if you read your Bible, and if you haven't read it, go back and do it, started off with the wrong track, did some pretty bad things, did some pretty evil actions. But we remember him for his greatness, for in the time he turned his life around and he came and he brought his people together. He conquered his enemy, he established boundaries for his land and brought prosperity to the people. And so today we find in the scripture his time is coming to an end. And he has this marvelous vision for the future. He's going to build a temple to God. He's not going to build a palace for himself. He's not going to build an artifice to be admired by the people. But a temple to God. Not for man, but for the God who taught him the right path. And so it is that he gives the greatest of all sacrifices, his wealth. And he did it with great joy. Inviting others then to join him, they followed in his way, and they gave again with great gifts. Great gifts are given to those that we love and we cherish. Think of the time you have given the right gift. You feel something in your heart and your soul when you do that. <laughs> this past week for Halloween, my grandchildren who are here in the area age 10, 9, and 6 don't get to McDonald's very often. I know that, and that's fine with me. They, um, last year, had received a few McDonald's coupons, however, when they went trick-or-treating, and I know they thought that was one of the greatest things. So this year, for Halloween, I sent them and gave them Halloween cards, but in each of their cards, I put four little McDonald's coupons. A coupon for a bag of apples, the child size, of course, a juice box, a hamburger, or an ice cream cone. One coupon per visit, but I gave each of the three grandchildren these four coupons. My six-year-old granddaughter opened the card and just went, wow, McDonald's, Grandma, you gave me the best gift I've ever gotten. I gave the right gift. I spent a dollar for the 12 coupons divided between the three of them, but according to her, it was just the right gift. And so I am still beaming with that idea and my sisters, or excuse me, my daughter's saying, I've got to go to McDonald's now and redeem these coupons. But I'm saying, Grandma gave the right gift. <laughs> and I feel good. And the kids feel good. This past week, letters went out, most of you probably received them, about this giving season here at CCB. A planned program for giving. We do that. We plan our giving. Some of us have started Christmas shopping. Some of us have thought about birthdays that will come before Christmas, and we've bought gifts already. The Christian movement is based on generosity. It is based on sharing the goodness of God with others. It is about glad obedience. Think of the stories that come first and foremost to your mind from the Bible. Jesus said 5,000. One story says 5,000, one says four, some say more. But Jesus fed people all the time. He made wine so that the wedding feast could be glorious and joyous. He gave. Think of the healing stories. One of the earliest ones where Jesus is at home and the crowd is so vast, the man is laid on a pallet and his friends bring him down through the roof. 
so that he might be healed, and Jesus heals them because of the faith of those who carried him. Jesus healed the leper. When most didn't give thanks, he still continued. He didn't say, oh, they'll never thank me. I'm not going to do this anymore. But he went forward. He healed the blind. He stopped the bleeding of a woman who had bled for years and years. He gave of himself. And he calls us to follow him. The Bible says that we know these stories so that we can know them and do greater things. And that's a scary scripture when you get down to it. Doing greater things than that that is done before. He wants our lives to be filled. That we give good gifts, that we rejoice. As I said, that wedding at Canaan, he made it a success because he filled those water jugs and turned them, and he had the water jugs filled, and turned them into wine. It was a few years ago I officiated at a wedding. It was in a local church here in the Detroit area, and I, the bride was the second cousin of the gal who sat back there every eighth or ninth Sunday of the year, and so she had a church affiliation, supposedly, but she came wanting to get married at the church. You know, that's one of the times people seek out churches still. And they seemed like a nice young couple. They were, indeed, a nice young couple. And I worked with them and did premarital counseling, and then it came to the rehearsal dinner, and all was going well, and I was enjoying myself that evening. And somebody said to me, well, now, Reverend Linda, you are going to come tomorrow to the wedding reception afterwards, aren't you? And I said, well, yes, I'd love to do that. Thank you. And then afterwards, that's one of the questions truthfully ministers usually hate the most. I didn't know anybody at the wedding. I was going to, but I just said I'd come to the reception. And there was that wedding was at one time, and the reception wasn't for two hours, and they asked me now, and I was going to expect it to give the blessing for the meal, so I was going to go, and I went. And then they had the problem of where to seat me. Uh, you know, our friends from work are pretty young and cool. We don't want her over there. And, you know, there's these cousins that really get pretty foul-mouthed over here, so we can't have her there. So I ended up sitting with the groom's parents. They had lived in the Detroit area for quite a while, but they had, some 10, 15 years earlier, retired and moved to Florida. Been involved with church a little bit here, but down there they had more free time. And so they found church a part of the community. So they were in a group of people that was starting a new church. The man talked about their million-some-odd-dollar building campaign. They had gotten so far as to acquire this land, and in that particular area of Florida, it was not cheap, but they had bought the land, but there was still so much more to do, so much more to acquire before they could actually get the blueprints and the lumber ready and start the construction. And so they talked about building their church. And then they looked out over the world and they heard about the storms and the uh, devastation in Haiti. And they found that in Haiti, where a church school building combination had been destroyed, they could build a new one for $4,000. And they quickly realized that in terms of their massive building campaign, that $4,000 they needed in Haiti would not make a major difference. And so they sent off a check to Haiti and then they sent off another check to Haiti. And he talked about how they had started to build a church and in actuality had built three in Haiti now and we're still working to build one in Florida. They had a vision. They had a vision for working and serving in God's kingdom. The Bible stories call us and we have over this past number of weeks called and been called into relationship. We are surely not self-sufficient. We give up our talent, our times, our treasures, our finances. Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Galatians, for whatever you sow, you will reap. Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken up, running over. It will be put in your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. First Timothy, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through the cravings that some have wandered away from faith. We need money to live. It is a fact. 
We have different amounts. We live differently. They often talk about tithing within the church. Well, most churches I know have some people who can give more than 10% to the church. A tithe, 10%. Some can do more than that. Others can't come close to it. But if the idea is, can you give? David gave everything and asked the people that followed him to do the same. I have been impressed these weeks that I have been here at CCB. Out on the table, the food collection. I've got to figure out how it works because I'm the newbie here, but we'll figure it out over the next couple of weeks. I'll learn. I learned for the first time and had my hands on project of SOS. I'd heard about it but didn't know anything about it. I know that some of you go tutoring and sharing with young children. We're supporting the animal shelter. We have done things for energy efficiency. The church is open and affirming. It is also unbeknownst to many of you or something you don't think about, it is a true gathering place for the community. I, living in Dearborn and never ever having been a morning person, sometimes get in here at 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning and I will say to Beth sitting in the office, oh, a quiet day. And she said, well, yeah, two groups have already come and gone. <laughs> this is known as a safe place, an important part of the community. Recovering community, worshiping community. Other faiths come here and use our facility and it is a blessing indeed that we share. David was about building a temple. We don't need to build a temple, but we need to build the kingdom. We're working at it and I'm impressed with how hard we're doing it. But are we doing it as well as we could? As efficiently as we could? We give not as an obligation, but as an opportunity that we might be the one who gives the best gift possible. I like that feeling. No one person can do it all, but we do it together. We each in our own lives have responsibilities, our time, our money, and our financial decisions indeed come down to competing priorities. Do you have to go out for steak dinners every week? Couldn't one night be a home goulash and a few more dollars to the church? Maybe we can do more, maybe you can't. Those are individual decisions, and as long as God knows you are making those decisions and doing your best, that is what is called for. Serving is not meant to be a burden, but indeed it is a blessing. We look at what we have and what we can do and how we can do it. The church has such a variety of things. You're not expected to give to everything. You're not expected to be here for every program and support every program. But you can do something. Where does your heart lie? What would make you feel that you have given the best gift ever? It doesn't need to be large. But if it is truly from your heart, Walter Brueggemann reminds us that everything is a gift from God. Nothing is an achievement or accomplishment independently, but all is given in God's generosity. We are not self-sufficient. When we are dazzled in gratitude, we need to keep nothing back in our anxiety about how, our, our, but we are able indeed ourselves to be generous. We are able to be generous. From the scripture, Lord our God, all this abundance that you have provided to build you a temple for your holy name comes from your hands and belongs first to you. Since I know, my God, that you examine the minds and take delight in honesty, I have freely given all things with the highest of motives. And now I have been delighted to see your people are offering so willingly to you. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken up, running over. You and I hold the future in our hands. We have to decide. We are the ones who move forward. For we have indeed been blessed. Amen and amen.